Good morning and welcome to the first ever AF Oliver uh, property market cast. So this is an historic moment. You are amongst the first, the first audience ever to see one of these things done online. I'm quite sure there's a number of you that have actually seen me do this in real life before. Well, today's version is a cut down version of uh, what I would normally do if I was there in your offices. Uh, I am going to try and condense this down into 25 minutes or so. So we'll get you all back at your desks at work by 9 a.m. That's not going to be easy, but I have with me the assistance of a fantastic technical team just out of camera shot here. I've got Ben, Joan and James who are going to help me through all this. Uh, and I'm sure you'll cut me a little bit of slack um, if I drop a line, miss a line or do something wrong uh, or have somebody's telephone come on halfway through my opening speech. So, right. OK, uh, let's get with it. Now, one of the really big deals uh, about doing property market, property market forecast and so on is actually trying to look forward rather than just looking at stats. So at various points through this presentation, uh, we'll be having what I call a canary piece of data. This is the classic early warning system, the canary spluttering down at the bottom of the coal mine. And, uh, and for me, there's certain key uh, performance indicators that I look at on a daily basis, which gives me a, a heads up of things that are about to happen. But before we get into the first part of the data, what I want to do is start to have a little bit of fun. We're going to ask you one or two poll questions before we kick off, and then we'll come back at the, uh, at the end of this uh, webcast uh, and ask you those questions again to see if we've actually shifted your opinions. So Ben, can I ask you please to stick the poll questions up on the screen? Um, and you should now be, hopefully, you are now seeing the poll questions. And what I'd like you to do is I would like you to tell me how you feel prices are going to move in the next three months, whether they're going to move up or whether they're going to move down. I'd then like you to actually extend that thought with everything that's going on uh, uh, and, and tell me how much prices would move in the next six months uh, and also in terms of volumes, the number of properties that actually get sold over the next three months and then over the next six months. So if I can get you all please to answer those poll questions, that'll be great and I can give you a sense uh, of how you're all feeling out there uh, and we'll see whether that shifts or not as we move through the webcast. In addition to which, on the bottom of your screen, hopefully there's a Q&A, there's a question and answer panel. So during the course of the presentation, if at any stage you want to ask me a question, Fire it in on that Q&A at the bottom there. Uh, one of my glamorous assistants in the room, and I'm talking more Ben here, uh, will turn his laptop around so I can see the questions. I'm not saying I'm going to be able to answer all of these in the middle of this uh, webcast. Those I'm not able to answer live as we go. I'll do that by email a little bit further down the line. OK, let's get into it proper. Uh, and uh, let's just have a look at the first piece of data. Um, so, oh, let me just click out. And by the way, uh, we're just getting the results coming in from that poll and I haven't, uh, I haven't got my glasses to hand. But uh, there's a universal thought, I think, over the next three months that we're going to see prices moving forward. Just a tiny little uh, number that actually think it's going to move backwards. Uh, and but over the six months, it's extraordinary how that shrinks down to about 50 percent. Uh, and with volumes, People actually see volumes are going to fall into this year. We'll come back to that in a moment or two. But for now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just focus on the here and now. Uh, and hopefully if technology is going to, to, to go with me. I want to kick off with reasons why we should feel upbeat about the way the market's going to be moving. OK, so um, reason number one. Well, the nationwide have weighed in with a February headline number of 12.6% house price inflation in the year to the end of Feb. Quite extraordinary. And I think Halifax weighed in just this week I think with in excess of 10%. We'll come back to the mo that in a moment or two. Our autumn surge that we all talked about as we came up towards the end of 2021 has become a winter surge. So that's another reason to be cheerful. Um, mortgage approvals, one of my canary pieces of data there, is actually still ahead of the pre-COVID average levels. We'll take a look at that in more detail in a moment or two. Um, and right move, 
When they published their February numbers the week before last, they said the asking prices have actually leapt up by the highest number ever since they've been carrying out their survey. So these are all reasons to be cheerful, but what about our causes for concern? Well, I think probably the most obvious one is the geopolitical upheaval that's going on with the war in Ukraine, uh, the effects that that's having on energy prices and consequently inflation. Uh, and those inflation numbers were creeping up before that the, the, the conflict actually started. So we can see that household bills are rising really sharply and that's bound to have an effect. I'm going to show you some GFK consumer confidence numbers as we go through this presentation, but let me just make it really clear that the numbers I'm going to show you was from data collected before the crisis actually started in the Ukraine. So that's a really important thing to think about. But in the meantime, even bearing in mind that that data was collected in the first two weeks in February, the general index actually now is as low as it's been since January 2021. It's a major cause for concern there. Interest rates. Interest rates are on their way up. We all know that this is the weapon that the government uses to try and counter inflation. And quite honestly, that's a, a big job right now. That's before the energy price hikes actually find their way through to these, these headline numbers. We've got inflation at 5.4%. That's a 30 year high. Uh, finally, agent stocks. Now it's a funny thing, isn't it? Supply and demand. I'm not gonna get into the mechanics of supply and demand in the uh, housing sector because I'd need another hour on its own just to do that. But suffice it to say, having more demand than supply, while it is a good thing to an extent, also has its flip side. And I am particularly worried about that. And I'll come on to that again a little bit uh, further on uh, in, into this presentation. So let's just take a look at some of the numbers behind those headlines then. Here we go. Here was the nationwide February index. And you can see there 12.6%, as I said, great big rise. But interestingly here, here's Robert Gardner, the chief economist at the Nationwide saying, nevertheless, it's likely that the housing market will slow in the quarters ahead. So even though they're publishing a huge rise, uh, record breaking rises, he's saying that the uh, market will slow in the quarters ahead. This is an important little chart here. We'll come back to that in a moment or two. Here's the Halifax numbers. Uh, house prices rise at the fastest annual rate since 2007. Quite extraordinary. But again, I've put this little quote in here that I pulled out of the Halifax report. Squeeze on household finances still expected to weigh on the market this year. So despite the two big building societies coming in with record price rises for the year to the end of February, they are both warning. They're putting caveats out on, uh, uh, against these numbers uh, and we would be foolish to ignore them. This is a great measure. I always pull this measure out of the nationwide report. It's their three month on three month price movement. So if you can look at these numbers over here, they go zero, one, two, three, four, five, etc. That's the quarterly rate of increase. So obviously that needs to be multiplied by four to give you an annual number. But because they they show the last three months on the previous three months, that gives us a really good idea of the trend. And you can see that if you ignore these COVID lockdown dips that are in this chart here, this is how I see the trend moving. Despite the big uptick that we got in February, I still see that trend coming off. And that's absolutely how I feel that the market is moving. I think that's a great reflection of where we're headed and the way this market is actually operating. OK, so we come to a canary slide now. Uh, this is a really important piece of data because these, this is one of these slides that enables us to look forward rather than back. So I don't want to just be standing here talking to you about events that have already happened. I want to try and give you a sense of where we're going next. And a great way to do that is to look at mortgage approvals. Obviously, the number of mortgage approvals feeds through into the number of properties that get bought. And, and the Nationwide have done a great job here. They've saved me a whole load of work. So these are basically Bank of England numbers, these mortgage approvals, but the Nationwide, bless them, have actually put these annotations on this chart for me, which is wonderful. And you can see here that if you actually look at their long run average from 2014 to 2019, 
Joan is just sticking me up a piece of paper saying that's 10 minutes gone. I can't believe that, I've only just started. But there we go. But if you take a look at the average, uh, a pre-COVID five years average here, mortgage approvals were running at about 66,000 a month. Here we sit, January 2022 at 74,000. It's a big number and it's well above the pre-COVID average. Nothing like it was as we launched into the extraordinary year that was 2021. But what that's saying to me is that the prediction that I actually made at the beginning of this year, or in fact wrote it back in December, I'm still feeling confident with. I think that we're going to see volumes this year that are below 2021. It was an extraordinary year at 1.5 million transactions. We're going to see them down, I'm thinking around 1.3 million, still well above the long run average. Um, I jumped over two slides there. This is quite important. I'm, I know I'm worried about time, but this is quite important. Do you remember back in the day, those of you that have been in the business a long time, we always used to talk about price to earnings ratio. And it used to be the thing we'd say, if it ran above 5%, we'd all start to worry. Well, of course, the world's changed. Interest rates now are way lower than they were then on, on average. Uh, and, and so that old 5% number that used to frighten us all to death has long since gone, but that's really climbing. These, here are the numbers supplied by Nationwide going back to 1992, and look where we sit here. So this is an all-time high during the last 30 years, and, and from that point of view, that's a concern for me, particularly if we're looking at interest rates being on the rise, and on the subject of interest rates, I hear you shout. This is quite an interesting little chart here. These are the current Bank of England uh, published interest rates uh, for mortgages uh, on a 75% loan to value. And you can see here that if you actually look here at the two year and three year and even five year money, there has been quite a sharp increase from the summer, from the autumn rather, September, as we've come through and these interest rates, the base rates have been lifted and the mortgage rates then are reflecting those. But what is quite interesting to see is that if you look at the 10 year money that sits up here around two and a half percent, that's actually come down slightly. So the money men, these guys that really know, and women I should add, these people that really know uh, about, about what's happening in the money markets, actually see the 10 year money getting a little bit cheaper. But this is an important headline number and will feed through into the public psyche. So that has an effect on uh, consumer confidence. Volumes, very quickly, here's the January numbers. The actual raw numbers, that's the green line, showed a dip, a fall in, in January. The red seasonally adjusted number showed a slight increase. 88,500 completions uh, in Jan. So. Uh, still well above um, uh, the long run average or the, the 2017 to 2019 pre-COVID average, even though it's below 2021. That's hardly a shock, it was an extraordinary year. Okay, so here's my next canary slide. And it's this one, it's the GFK consumer confidence uh, data. This really is hugely important. This is a massively reliable indicator to the way the market is going to move. This data, by the way, is freely available on the GFK website, but we actually take it and put it on this particular chart because it makes it much easier to interpret. Very briefly then, that red line there is zero. Anything that's above that red line, that's people answering in the affirmative. They think things are going to get better. Anything that's below that red line, that means people think it's going to get worse. The actual red line on the chart itself, the red data line is the overall index score. And you can see that's well and truly into negative, but crucially from around the summer, the June, July time, that's just continued to fall. And you can see at the moment that's running at minus 26. That is a worrying piece of data. This blue line here, is how people feel the UK economy is going to move over the next 12 months. The question is, will it perform better or will it perform worse? And look where that's sitting. And you've actually got to go all the way back here to, to lockdown time, essentially uh, 2020, before you saw numbers quite that bad. This green line in here is the climate for major purchases. 
Are the next 12 months a, a good or a bad time to make a major purchase, whatever that might be, a car, a kitchen, or a house, of course. And you can see that confidence increased all the way through 2021 as the market improved and things got better and better. And we popped up into positive territory in July. First time we've seen that uh, 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 until uh, go, you have to go back to before COVID to see that in positive territory. But since that time, it's continued to slide and it has taken a really big dip since the autumn. And finally, this important line that runs along the top there, rock solid. These are, peop this are, these are people's views of their own personal finances, how they're going to fare over the next 12 months. Are they going to get better? Are they going to get worse? And people in the UK are really hardy souls. So despite COVID, despite Brexit, remember Brexit? Remember that little thing that's still sitting there waiting? Despite all of that, they felt that their personal finances were going to be OK over, the, over the, the, the coming year. But even that measure here has started to fall and has actually come into negative territory in February. This is important to us. This is a canary slide and this really gives us an indication of how the market's going to move. I'm acutely aware right now put a desirable property on the market. It's sold within hours rather than days or weeks. And I know you're yeah, picking up anecdotal evidence from around the country. That is how it is. And, and I think that is underpinning the way the market's performing right now. But I look at this data and I look further forward and I see that has to change. That has to ease. A brief look at the RICS uh, survey. Um, the, the canary slides out of the RICS survey really are these two. So these are the newly agreed sales. Now, don't forget, this is the January survey. So these are the agents answering the survey for the transition of the month from December into January. So we need to keep that in mind. And this works on a similar basis to that GFK chart that I was showing you just now. In other words, opinions that people feel that they are negative, that they're getting worse, are actually below that line. And people that feel that things are going to get better and are going to improve, they come above that line. And you can see at pretty much all of the regions throughout the UK, there was a fall in newly agreed sales as we went December into January. And what about this on the Canary slides as well from the RICS? new vendor instructions. These are really important because one of the big issues that we face in the market right now is the shortage of and scarcity of stock for sale. And you can see that in terms of new vendor instructions from December into January, there was a fall pretty much in every region uh, with, with one or two minor exceptions there. One of them being London, I might add, uh, in the UK from uh, December into January. That results in this. These are the national average stocks per surveyor, per agent, and you can see where it sits. Here's the little lockdown dip here, 2020 lockdown dip, and look where we are. We're only just above where we were in the middle of the lockdown. That's a real worry. And when you look at the average stock per surveyor, not only are they at record lows, but you can see all these floating blue diamonds sitting in uh, above the monthly bar charts there. These are the three month long run average and here's the current numbers, and you can see how that shows a trend of falling stocks. Stocks that continue to fall. I'll show you some right move data on that in a moment as well. Here's how the agents feel that the market's going to move. Uh, over in this chart here, these are their price expectations. Uh, the one in the dot in the broken line there, the light blue broken line there, is how they feel prices are going to move over the next 12 months. The one in the darker solid line there is how they feel prices are going to move over the next three months. Uh, and uh, you can see there that the agents and the surveyors, the valuers, believe that prices are still rising, but confidence is nowhere on the short term measure is nowhere near as high as it was. Uh, and if you look at how the regions of the RICS um, survey uh, have responded, you can see that over the next three months, pretty much every region throughout the UK is expecting prices to move up and forward. Pick up the right move. This is where we, we this is a really big shift in data here because we're moving from indices like the Halifax and the Nationwide, which are basically prices achieved. These are mortgage approved, uh, mortgage approvals, prices that sold. When we come into the right move index, these are asking prices. So these prices haven't yet been achieved, but you can see here uh, how big a 
jump we've seen in the February numbers, taking us up to a 9.5% increase across the year. It's the biggest ever monthly price jump on the Right Move Index. And when you start to dig down into the Right Move Index, uh, and I've got to tell you, both the right, 20 minutes gone now, both the right move and the Zoopla indices are well worth taking a look at. They're both online. Uh, and you can see here, here's their asking price trend. Here's their five year asking price trend. And this just shows you the monthly uh, jump. But down here is a really interesting number. And don't forget how big this right move data bank is. These are the average number of days it takes to secure a buyer on a national basis. And this hit a real low, you can see here, in June, the average time property was taking to actually sell was uh, dropped all the way down here to 36 days. But look how that's beginning to climb. So that you know, my takeout from that is that we've got this big leap in asking prices going on here, because people are aware that this is how the market's operating. operating. Everyone is looking to push the prices uh, as far and as fast as they can. But then the consequence of that is that we've got the amount of time it's taking to sell picking up to. Uh, and in terms of time picking up, I need to get a move on as well. You can see here, here are the right move average stock uh, per agent. It's a really important number because that's a big, big sample. And you can see how that is falling here. Look at this, January 2021 here, nearly 60. Uh, um, uh, properties for sale average and every agent throughout the UK all the way down to 40 in January. All dark green in the right move index. I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, move to the Zoopla index. This is a really interesting difference here because Zoopla uh, actually collect and collate their data in a slightly different way. And they've got a unique blend in their data uh, where they actually take uh, agreed sale prices and asking prices and blend the two. And that actually gives us that wonderful combination in between uh, ancient or old data and what's going to happen next. It's always a really good in index to follow. And you can see at the moment that's sitting at 7.8% 7 7 for the year, average growth. This is a really good map, well worth taking a look. So this is the UK annual, uh, average price map similar to the right move one that I showed you just now, but with a, a different uh, way of collecting the data, but also in there, they've got city data as well, which I find particularly useful when we're looking at local markets. I had a, a client for many, many years, a guy called Terry Flower, who was at Alfred McAlpine Homes for years. And one of his favorite sayings to me was, if you take a man and you stick his head in the oven and his feet in the fridge, is he, on average, comfortable? Uh, and I think that actually just demonstrates how beautifully misleading averages can be. So we need to be careful. Uh, so it's when we drill down more into the regional data that gives us an, indicate, uh, an indication of how differently the markets are moving in the UK. And not just geographically. Uh, it's amazing how different the markets are moving for house types as well. So the way uh, the, the prices are moving on apartments and flats is completely different from the way they're moving on, on uh, houses with gardens, uh, are particularly semi and detached. Here are the Zoopla price trends. This is a great line to follow here. And you can see here their quarterly. So this is a pretty much like the equivalent of the nation one that I showed you, three months on three months. And you can see here, that is painting such a clear trend for me. And I see that carrying on as we move through the year. Okay, so let's take a look at the takeouts then. How are we doing for time then, Joan? One minute 20 left. One minute 20 left. <laughs> Whew, okay, so here are the takeouts. Volumes are going to be lower than 2021. I don't think there are any prizes for saying that. 2021 caught us all by surprise at 1.5 million transactions. They are going to be higher, though, than the pre-COVID average, that 1.2 million that we'd seen so regularly over the last five years, or the five years from 2014 to 2019 leading up to COVID. Uh, I predicted 1.3 million. I'm pretty much convinced that's still going to be the case. I'm equally in no doubt whatsoever that we are going to see the rate of house price inflation fall as we go on through this year. I'm absolutely in no doubt about that. The data that I'm seeing on a local basis, the data I'm seeing on a site-by-site -site basis for new build developments, 
everything suggests to me that this will not continue. So I think that we're going to see that fall. And my prediction, my firm prediction on that as things stand, is that we'll end the year with an inflation rate of around 6%. Stock levels remain perilously low. Uh, and uh, this, this can be a good and a bad thing, obviously, is that if there's higher demand than supply, that underpins prices. But you do get to a point where there is so little stock available uh, that people say, well, do you know what? We won't move this year, we'll wait. Okay, that's my take out for the, for the uh, brief presentation. I can't believe I've rushed through that so quickly. We didn't really get enough time, did we, to do our Q&A or our second poll. Have we got, can we put our second poll up for those of you that can give me another minute or so? Uh, let's just see if anything that I've said to you over the past 30 minutes has actually changed a view. So here are those same questions that we asked you right back at the start. Seems like a lifetime ago now, doesn't it? Uh, here's those same four questions. Um, and I'd be interested to, to see whether your views have changed. So can I perhaps ask you to uh, fill in the poll questions? How are we looking? Uh, that, that is that's broadly similar, broadly similar. I think probably where we have changed the thought on that is on volumes a little bit. Um, I'll report back to you on the results of those. Uh, and what I will do for the questions that have come in uh, during this uh, webcast, I will, we'll, we'll send those answers out by email. We're going to make a recording of the uh, presentation available for you um, on YouTube. And I will make sure that all of you that uh, have attended today uh, get, a copy, uh, get a copy of that um, recording so that you can take a look at that. Uh, we'll do this again. Uh, I can think of a hundred things I'd like to improve in between this first go and the next go. But you can say you were here at the first one. Just wait a couple of years time when I've got like 1.2, 1.3 million audience, you'll be able to say that you watched the first one ever. So thanks very much for attending. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you probably in April, but we'll notify you when that date is going to be. Thanks. Have a great day.